living in the jungle of the modern web, our main character is lost. Since he started his career, weeks after weeks, years after years, he saw the birth of many revolutionary and promising tools. But tomorrow, maybe, those could all vanish and be replaced by new ones, even more better. It is with lots of sadness and a bit of melancholia that he remembers these frameworks, these libraries, these code editors, common line tools, etc. Please show some respect. If they haven't already disappeared from our projects, maybe they already disappeared from our coolness radars. This situation worries him and keeps him up at night. In his current job, he has to do to make decisions, to, to make technical choices, yet he doesn't know what to do anymore. It is at the, this very moment that our main character decided to see a therapist. This side, okay. Hello, doctor. Hello, Mr. Sablonier. Oh, nice to see you. I saw you like 10 years ago, right? You just started your first job and you had some kind of PTSD around space versus tabs, right? And the pronunciation of, of animated GIFs. You mean GIFs, right? <laughs> yeah, but that's all in the past now. I was young. I was, I was asking myself the wrong questions. And I recently took a, a step back, you know, about the front-end dev, front-end web, and I made an observation. There's way too... <laughs> I'm mad, as you can see. This is gonna happen a lot. Okay, so I'm way too much... There's way too much, sorry, hype in, in front-end web about toolings. We, we've become all addicted to them. Okay, uh, tell me more. What kind of problems can, can it... Sorry. Okay, yeah, tell me more. What kind of problems can it really impact? So, problem number one, um, when you are asked a question, do you always use a PowerPoint? Yes, that's pretty handy. Anyway, so, problem number one, um, when we choose a framework, a front-end library and its ecosystem, we often don't, we often forget the original problem we want it solved, and yet, we already think we find the solution to the right tool to use. And most of the time, this is the right tool for the right job, okay? But sometimes, it's a tool that solves problems we don't really have. Why on earth would you do that? Well, you know, it's because tools are cool, right? So we, we put the developer experience on top of the user experience. The user, the very user, of the product we are trying to build. Sometimes it's because it's used by web giants, you know, big five and yeah, it's so cool. Okay, go on, go on. Problem number two, once we choose an ecosystem of tools, we tend to get locked into it. We open the door and then we, we stay cozy in this room, you know, and this means when we look um, how to solve X or Y, we are going to go to Stack Overflow and prefix all our searches with React, Angular, or Vue, but we are just trying to display dates or sort arrays. So, I mean, we've been doing that with jQuery and it's the same all over again. So we are gonna, you know, build again a new select, a new data grid component for yet another ecosystem of frameworks. We, we're just like fanboys and fangirls. We don't always see the limitations of the tools we use, but yet we, we love and we convince ourselves that the shiny new features, we, we really need them, but we don't always understand them well. And so we're gonna fill our, our brains with you know, specific features from frameworks instead of you know, filling them with well-known standards and patterns. Okay, I see. Problem number three, this, is, this one is pretty universal. We easily forget about basics, patterns, well-known practices like solid separation of concerns, etc. So we tend to write code that is 
highly strongly coupled and that does not age well with time in a world where everything goes really fast it's it's a big problem instead of having very um, defined isolated layers we write modules that mix you know several responsibilities that rely on the global scope etc so in the end when our ecosystem evolves when it disappears or even when a new standard uh, rises it often becomes very hard to replace this one by one so we're going to throw away lots of knowledge and lots of code i mean who loves um, featureless refactorings right so okay but i'm completely lost about what you just said Hmm. But it's just like my TV, you know. No, it's that way. Sorry. It's it's just like my TV, you know. Like t ten years ago, when I I went to see you, I just started my new job, and with my internship m money, I bought a new TV, and it works like ten years ago, except on last week episode of Game of Thrones. But anyway, uh, it still works, and it's still relevant because my TV only does one thing, and it does it well. It receives something audio and video via HDMI. So it doesn't need to know what I'm going to plug uh, into it. So at first I had a giant PC in my living room, then I had a smaller one. I, I plugged many different devices that didn't, didn't exist right then. And yet it worked. I even discovered that it was able also to send signals to my Android TV, for example. Anyway, today when I look at front-end projects, I see this. Oh, TV VCR combos. Yeah, I had one of those. You, you did? Yeah, yeah. It was really handy. You didn't have to worry about the wires, the, the configuration. It was almost magical. But yes, when our VCR broke, we had to throw it away and buy everything. So you see what I mean, right? You see why I'm lost. OK, I see, I see. The best solution in your case is group therapy. So I, I think group therapy with lots of profi professionals from your industry. So I gathered, I gathered a lot of um, a small group here. Well, it's not what I call a small group anyway. It's going to be fine. You're going to be all right. <sighs> Hello, everyone. My name is Omer Sablonnier. I'm a web, de web developer at Clever Cloud. And today I want to talk about the web, its frameworks and libraries, and its standards. You know, like a very simple topic without any polemics or drama. We're going to try to deconstruct uh, all of this to, in the hope of maybe building better web apps tomorrow. OK, so we are using lots of shiny stuff, uh, shiny tools every day that bring us solutions. but what was the problem anyway, right? And so in this part, I try to list uh, main problems I encountered in my many different experiences working on, a, on some web projects. And I see two sides. So problems I want to solve for the users of the product I'm building and problems I have with my team when I'm developing the product. So as a user, I want a blazing fast first load I want following navigations to be fast. I want smooth and, you know, reactivity, 60 FPS animations and refreshes. I want it to be careful with my battery, especially if I'm using Chrome, sorry. And I want it to be accessible for everyone and on every device I own. Okay, so here we already see the context is, the context is key. I mean, we don't have the same problems, and the priority of those problems will clearly depend on what you are coding in your different contexts. Uh, if you're working on something that is, for the user, highly you know, productive, and like Gmail or Slack, the first load is not your main problem. At least it's not the one of the tools I mentioned, but it, we have the same problem at my company. But if you're working on a, something more reading contents, navigation, maybe having 60 FPS refreshes, etc., is not your main problem. So as developers, we want to save time. We want to avoid reinventing the wheel, obviously. We want to write clean code, reusable code. We want abstractions 
that can help us, you know, remove the, the complexity and have some simple mind thinking. We definitely want to isolate impacts. We, we don't want to touch something here and crossing fingers like, am I going to break something? We want to avoid error and bugs as soon as possible. And if possible, collaborate with muggles, you know, non-developers. Um, so here, uh, compared to users, the importance is not on what you are trying to build, but with whom you're coding. And so it will depend on your team, its experience, and you may not have the same team as Gmail or the latest two-person startup. So if you're a back-end developer, maybe back-end developers here, hmm. you may be thinking, yeah. Uber, you just listed basic problems we've been trying to solve for the past 10 years. Front end is simple. What is all this complexity you've been creating with Webpack and stuff? <laughs> Back end developer saying it's complex. Okay, let's put the irony of this on the, sign on the side and really ask the question, how did we get here? So, in order to understand where you're going, we need to know where we come from. And sorry, I don't remember who said that, but uh, I definitely, she or he is definitely right. So at the beginning of the web, and yes, I discovered during my talk that the web and the browser is a triangle. Why not? So follow me. At the beginning of the web, we had the user requesting a, a URL. The browser did an HTTP request uh, to the server, getting some HTML that was server-side uh, templated on the back end. And then we had a document uh, inside the browser. Then we added images, CSS, and you know, some forms. It, it forms was the first time we, in, we were able as users to interact with the document. And then we added JavaScript. Yeah, I know. So, yeah, JavaScript. So new player in town, the JavaScript engine. So at first we had in yellow this uh, interface to talk with the browser, the, the DOM, obviously. So first we, we tried some small DOM modifications, you know, form validation, etc. And then we had the Ajax error and we did everything. First we did form submissions with Ajax, we loaded uh, server-side templated HTML. Then we were like, okay, let's just get the JSON. We'll do the templating on the client. And we did templating, routing, etc. So clearly, those are really complex, but we ended up with a giant pile of JavaScript on the client side. So those problems are complex to solve because during that time, we added mobile in, in the equation. We added... Uh, threads with workers, etc. So all of this became really complex and the current tool tooling is trying to, you know, get the better of both worlds from server side and client side. And yes, this is complex. So if those problems are, are complex, we need to. So what do frameworks bring to the table? And so right now we should be, oh, you, you talked about React, but React is not a framework, you know? Okay, if you want to be right about that, you're right. React is the, the V in MVC, okay. But my point is, when you choose one of those t modern tooling, you enter a room and you, you kind of, you know, you stay in the room. Yeah, it's a caricature, caricature? yeah, sorry. It's, it's a bit too much, but in the end, lots of projects are really that way. And so it's a vertical way of thinking about everything. I don't like that. So I prefer a horizontal way of thinking about all of this. So I try to draw a bookshelf. Yeah, bookshelf, yeah? Okay, thanks. So we are gonna try to uh, store every 
see, see the, the front-end world in an horizontal way and store different solutions that those tooling are bringing without thinking too much in this is React, this is Vue, etc. So the first thing we are going to store in the, in the bookshelf is component system. And when I say component system, it's really different from the way you write uh, your components. It's more the, the way the components uh, live inside your brother, browser at runtime, but also the way you design it, the, its API. And so it doesn't really change anything for, for your users, but for you it's really reusability and isolation of impacts. So obviously all modern frameworks, uh, Angular, React, and Vue, provide you with a set of, uh, of tuning to, to create components. They basically work the same way, um, especially Angular and Vue are attributes and properties, events out. React is like everything is props and we don't send the uh, events, but you have to give us a callback and we'll call it. If you take a step back, it's a bit like the same behavior, but with a different uh, mechanism. Uh, then we have templating. Here, it's really, it's really about you. I mean, if you're using this tooling, this tooling, or this one, it doesn't change anything for your users. So tomorrow, if you go from React or Vue, it won't change much except maybe the first loading, because it can have an impact on that. But basically, the way you're going to write your components is uh, the deal here. So React is well known to have invented JSX. So they were like, OK, um, Angular and Vue are view model. So you create some kind of model dedicated for the view, and you push it inside the template. And React was like, if you watch the first um, presentation, well, we often modify both at the same time, so maybe we're going to put them together, which is actually not something I'm against. Uh, I would even argue that it doesn't really uh, violate the um, separation of concerns. It's, it's really interesting. What I have a problem with is that JSX is basically a fork of JavaScript. If you don't agree with me, we can argue afterwards, sorry. But Facebook um, decided for us to migrate all our tooling, uh, code editors, compilers, linters, etc., just to add templating to JavaScript. Yeah. And if you change that tomorrow again, you won't have many benefits for your users. It's all about the developers. So then we have CSS authoring. Again, it's more about isolation of impacts, and it could have a small impact on your users at first load. Uh, Angular and Vue has similar um, behaviors on this. Uh, they have native isolation with some standards and some emulation with some tooling. And React is like, yeah, we, we don't want to solve that problem, so basically lots of people in the community um, went to something called CSS and JS with lots of different toolings. So I would say it's the way React developers do it, but it's not part of the framework. Then we have what is maybe the most important uh, thing in our shelf, uh, bookshelf, is the DOM manipulation. And again, it's completely different from the way you write your templates. You could write templates with Angular, Vue, React, or at least the way they propose you to do it, and have complete different ways behind the, the curtain to manipulate the DOM. And what's funny is that React, for example, in the first few years was like, we have a virtual DOM, it's great. And everyone, on, if you look at Stack Overflow, is like, OK, uh, Angular is cool, but does it have a virtual DOM? I mean, why would you care? The question is, is it fast or not? And if they change tomorrow, and they actually removed every, uh, almost every marketing about the virtual DOM in their documentation, but if they change the model tomorrow, it wouldn't change much for you as long as it's still fast. So uh, there are many ways to do it. Uh, React and Vue do something with a, a virtual DOM implementation, 
Angular is different. Some new tunings also have smart ways to manipulate the DOM. But again, we as developers, we just don't want to do it ourselves. I mean, jQuery was nice, but find something, modify, etc. It was always very stateful and not really easy to have a besides simple uh, mind model. But it, it has lots of impact for users. So I covered the different implementations. Uh, then we have three other uh, uh, line in our bookshelf. I'll go through them very quickly because I really want to insist on those four ones. But then we have server-side rendering. As I said, we moved from server-side rendering to client-side rendering, and then we were, okay, but uh, what about SEO? What about first load speed? What about non-JavaScript users or, or user agent? agent? So this really has an impact on both those things. Angular has its own way to do it with the Angular Universal. The other um, frameworks has um, community projects that allows you to do it. Again, depending on your context, it may not be a problem you have, but if we all add simple tools to do it, we would all want first load fast and second navigation fast. Then we have the router. So the router is only about uh, doing client-side navigation, obviously. Funny thing, uh, and that's where I can agree with you that React is more of a library than a framework, because Angular has everything inside it. The other one are more like composites with some other tooling. It is the case for the router, but it's funny. It's like, yeah, but the router is different, so it, it, you're not you know, locked into React. Yeah, but everyone is using React router, so I mean, it's the same problem or the same conclusion. Uh, then state managers, um, also it's really about having simple mind model about modifying data. Uh, on the Angular uh, community, you have several projects, MobX, etc. React is obviously about Redux and Vue about Vuex. They, there is some similar patterns between all of them. It's quite interesting to compare them and to see if you really need one and which one, which um, abstraction you need. There are many other stuff you should analyze on your own context uh, on the way your front-end project is, is composed. So you should look at everything. Whoa. Is it supposed to happen? I'm going to check. We are back. Um, yeah, so again, we, we don't have time to go to the details, but what I did on my project was to look at everything those frameworks bring me, if I need them, how they work, and compare them. But having this you know, uh, horizontal way of thinking about those give me solutions, I don't have to look at them in this vertical way, really allowed me to to take a step back and see if I could replace parts of my current stack. So, uh, often here, browsers should put, uh, I often hear, uh, here, sorry, browsers, people saying browsers should implement React and we'll be done with it because it works. It's really a question that is harder. So let's look a bit at the, what standards bring to the table. If you remember when we had jQuery, it did a lot of things, and then, for example, uh, querying elements with a CSS selector. Then it arrived as a standard inside browsers. So in the end, we just had a, some sugar on top of the you know, low-level browser API, and, and uh, jQuery was just like, was less of an implementation and more of a sugar on top of it. And I, I see lots of things going that way. So we're going to look quickly at web components. And I'm going to talk again about my TV. Because basically, my TV is kind of a web component. 
it's kind of a something that should do so, one thing and do it well, should not think too much about what I'm going to plug on it. It's the same for any kind of components, React, Vue, et cetera, but here I'm, I'm taking the example of uh, web components. So in web components, we have custom elements. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to show code, but what you really need to think about is the first line on the shelf, component system. And on web components, I have attributes, properties, and I have methods. And when you think about that, really take some time to look at the current HTML elements. Lots of them have methods. I mean, a form have a, has a reset method, has a submit method. Um, there are also properties that are not strings or, or booleans. Lots of people think, yeah, but uh, HTML elements only handle strings. That's completely false. If you look at a canvas element, a video element, etc., there are lots of methods and, and properties that are not strings. And uh, the other way around, we have events. And that's really the HDMI and HDMI CEC of, of components in general. But this is in your browsers. So because it's standard, and it should be in Edge in a few months, because it's standard, you, you, we, maybe we should, it's my opinion, maybe we should all agree on that model and think about what's missing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go to the details, but on my bookshelf, it goes here. I put some dashed, uh, dashed borders because it doesn't go at the same level of uh, usability and, and, you know, uh, syntax sugar uh, as the frameworks, but it covers some of the same role. Uh, but it has limitations. It's not because it's a standard that we should have the same, you know, oh, this is so cool, I'm going to... I'm going to buy a web component socks and, and, and beanie, and I'm going to be a fanboy of web components. No, there are limitations. So there are a few of them that you can encounter, and some of them that you may not never see. But you can't do built-in uh, customized elements in Safari. So if you want to extend the button or something like that, you, you can't. You don't have a real data binding on, on properties. You can react on attribute change, but not properties. So you have to use getters or, or setters and proxy. You don't have hot module reloading. I mean, it's 2019. When I'm editing a file, I want my local development web app to, to refresh and only refresh the components I, I just edited. Right now, it's not possible, and I would say it's it's a limitation as, as a developer in the developer experience. We have a few um, um, drafts that are being written at, at the W3C, et cetera, discussed around forms, uh, defining elements other way around. I really push you to, to look at them. Then we have Shadow DOM. And so we talked about virtual DOM this is Shadow DOM. This, this is completely different. I don't know who to blame for the, all the stack overflow question. Yeah, but now we have Shadow DOM. It will be even better than Virtual DOM. It has nothing to do. It's completely unrelated. Virtual DOM is an abstraction to change the, the DOM and have something really efficient, n not to be um, something really efficient to manipulate the DOM. Shadow DOM is just a, a, a word to say we're going to isolate CSS and some JavaScript API, but it's also a way to have some slot. So if you want a component, but inside your component you want the user of your component to put something, so it, it's really like a frame. This is also covered by the, the Shadow DOM spec. So if I take my TV, I have at the, the API of my component is attribute properties, methods, events, but it's also, as a user of the component, putting a, putting a slot into it and also maybe customizing some CSS uh, from the outside with custom properties. So Shadow DOM is about 
the CSS isolation, so I put it on this line, but it's also with slots about the component system and its runtime API. Again, it has lots of limitations. Uh, the first and most important one is no server-side rendering. I mean, lots of people are like, yeah, forget about the frameworks, web components will be the, will replace everything. Spoiler, they won't, or at least it's more complicated. But then they say, just use the platform. Okay, I'm going to use the platform, but I need JavaScript to render HTML and CSS. Duh. It's, it's really something that frustrates me. Right now, we have no way to have a first load of a web page with web components with JavaScript disabled. So that means before having something on screen and isolated CSS, etc. You need to load JavaScript, you need to parse it, and you need to execute it, which is sometimes rather long and s stupid since HTML and CSS should be able to do it without that. Again, my opinions. Uh, there are a few um, drafts edited to solve that problem. When you look at the, the minutes from the meetings, it's not clear if it's going to be standardized one day, so we'll see. And then we have templates. Templates are boring, um, my opinion again. Doesn't do much, but helps you to clone uh, a template really efficiently. So I put it in the templating view model, but again, it should help you to do your DOM manipulation also. And that's something that may arrive, so no interpolation or reactive data binding, but we may have a, a way to define a template with holes and with just standard APIs say, this is my data, this is my data, and have something really efficient to, in the browser without any runtime libraries to manipulate the DOM. And yeah, HTML modules. So look at this web page by Google. It's really, really nice to have good practices about web components. If you want to follow the Game of Thrones of uh, browser vendors, it happens here. There's like giant discussions about, we should do that, no, no, yes, maybe. It's, it's crazy, but it's interesting. Uh, there are a few um, Twitter accounts to, to follow that are interesting. This one is telling you what is about to ship in different browsers. This one also. Anyway, so. <clears throat> Will web components replace your web frameworks? No. Are they cool? I think so, and very much. But I think they will, a bit like jQuery did, provide new low-level API for frameworks, and sometimes will push uh, tool authors to create new ways of having solutions for web applications. Uh, we will cover a bit about the future afterwards. But since we saw a bit more about how frame, what frameworks bring, what standard brings, I think you should have a better vision of the different layers that compose a web project. And where it's pretty hard, when, even when you know that, to, you know, to isolate everything and have r write code that really will age well with time. So for this, we obviously need good practices, software, well-known uh, patterns that we've been using on the back end for, for some time. And so, again, I forgot who said that, sorry. I did lots of research and I forgot to mention him or her. But code should be disposable. It's far easier to do when things are decoupled. And so I can't, uh, I don't have time to explain you how to decouple your React code, your Angular code, etc. What I can do is explain to you what this analysis allowed us at Clever Cloud to, to evolve our stack and which kind of choice we did. And maybe this will help you to make different choices or, or similar. Um, so, at Clever Cloud, we are a um, 
platform as a service company, you do a git push, we put your applications in production. If you want details, we'll see at the end. Um, but here I'm going to show you what we are trying to evolve in our stack. So this is our, our um, dashboard. Uh, I have my application here. It's like uh, it's running, blah, blah, blah. But I have a screen where I can set up environment variables. And we chose this screen to migrate some of our tooling because it's, it was quite simple, just forms, uh, additions, uh, buttons, etc., and some uh, REST uh, call uh, APIs. And so the current stack is the current stack is this one. Oh yeah, this is a seven-year-old stack. Sorry, so. Templating is done with Lodash templates. It works. Uh, CSS is done with less CSS, with lots of global stuff. We, we don't have an isolation mechanism apart from having like, like um, you know, good practices like BEM, etc. So naming conventions. Uh, we do all the DOM manipulation with jQuery and BaconJS. Who knows BaconJS? It's a bit like RxJS, but it's less. Uh, fashion, I, I, I guess. I don't know. We don't have any server-side rendering, so we are just as fast to load as Gmail, sorry. And uh, we have an homemade router, which was created by the boss, so it's a good <laughs> router, right? Uh, and we, sorry, we don't have a proper state management, as you would say, with React, etc. But we use the Bacon JS library, which is based on streams, to have some kind of similar patterns. So our needs, in our context, is we want to say goodbye to Bacon JS and Lodash, Lodash templates. We want uh, real components with isolation. We, we want to stop modifying something. And, and being worried about impacts. Uh, we want reusability uh, for us, but also because we, we are about maybe to, to be integrated by other companies as a white label product. Uh, when I say re reusability, I mean, I write uh, comments in my code. I write them for my colleagues, obviously, but I also write them for me, for, you know, six month or one, one year future me. Uh, because when I go back to the project, I want to still understand what's happening. And it's the same for components. You're writing them so third parties can integrate them, but you're also writing them for yourself in six months when you want to change parts of the stack. Think about that. So we want to avoid featureless uh, refactorings, no big bang and introduce uh, fe uh, new tools feature by feature. Uh, so what's interesting is the way we, we approach that is having a design phase from top to bottom. So take a pen, design, OK, what is my new environment viable uh, UI going to look like? So top components, then I need this, etc. But the development phase should be done from bottom to top. So you start really by the low level components. And this is a very efficient way to have isolation. Because when you work on the low level components, it's a bit like when you work on a REST API. You're trying not to think too much about your future users. You, you know what you need to, to take into. You, need what, you know what you need to output but not too specific, so it can be a bit more future-proof. And so for that, we use Storybook. Anyone know Storybook? Oh, you, sh you should really look at it. There's a great video by Marie-Laure Thuré. There's a French version and an English version at React Conf. Uh, originally, it was React Storybook, but now it works with Anything Angular, Vue, React, the new one that came up last week, etc., and HTML. So, small demo. React is actually a, um, Storybook is a, a web app. Our Storybook is public, but it has nothing yet. 
So this is the one that, I, that I'm working on uh, right now, and it's going to be public soon. Uh, so, as I said, we started with the low-level uh, components. We often call them atoms, uh, regarding the atomic design worlds. So here I have my buttons, and um, this is completely different from the code of my application. I'm developing them, designing them here, and I'm going to reuse them afterwards in my application. And what's nice is that you can set some knobs. Uh, I can say, hello... CERN, and this is a way for me to document and to show off the possibilities of my components, obviously. Uh, so those are the really low-level things I needed for my um, environment variables form. Then I went to uh, the, component, the component that is only the name, the value, and a button. And what's nice here is that I can, um, here, it, it's not one component, it's several times the same one. But I can put it with different configuration on the same screen, modify my code, have live reloading and test stuff, CSS or JS, etc., and verify that if I click on a button, I have the right uh, event that is emitted. Uh, if I modify values, etc., I know what changed. And we... Again, sorry. We, we worked on the different components from bottom to top that way. So after that, we created a component to create a new environment variables. Again, uh, we just had to check if uh, it emits the right events. And always thinking not too much about the parent. Just I just need to emit something with the name and the value, and maybe uh, also do uh, validation. And that way, we were able to create this form. So we have the component for the creation, several times the component for the editing, and each time I'm editing something, I get an event with the current state. And what's really nice is if your API and your isolation is right, you can create, just like any object-oriented programming, create an, another component that has the same API, but that does something different. So here we are modifying a set of environment variables, but I could modify them with a giant text area, right? And since I have the same input, same attributes, properties, and the same events, uh, so here I can, you know, each time I'm modifying, I have the complete state that is emitted, just like the other component, and so I can have a full uh, form that can play between uh, simple mode and uh, expert mode. So if I go to expert, hello, son is here. You see the deal. The idea is that because we try to isolate stuff that way, we we really gain from the from from the isolation. Okay. So for that, we, we used web components. Uh, it's an implementation detail for, for our users, but for us, it's a way to, to be sure we have a, an isolation model that will stand during the time. We use lit element and lit HTML to, to be some kind of sugar on top of web components and to provide what wasn't you know, provided because I put it some dashed borders. With that, we are at some similar level at what modern frameworks would bring for those four uh, parts. There are obviously lots of stuff React Angular View are bringing you that we don't have with this. And we kept the router for now. <laughs> Again, we are trying to replace new components, and this one was already existing, with this, but we'll keep the overall application with the current router and the current code without doing a big thing. Uh, I'm going to skip details about lit element and lit HTML, but again, I'm going to ba go back at this. If you are writing a component that is mixing UI, state, I mean, remote data, uh, if, if your component knows where the data comes from, when you want to go from REST API to cached data to 
I don't know, GraphQL or, or server sent events, etc. You've coupled things really strongly, and it's really hard to change. Uh, for example, the, the environment variables are loaded with a REST API call, but tomorrow we'd like to, to cache the results and maybe to update it with some server sent events. So if you really isolate your layers, it, come, it becomes better to do. And I would say, again, my opinion, that React and in our view, in lots of articles, are forcing you or pushing you to mix, like, uh, you know, the, the remote data with the UI or putting Redux everywhere inside your components. And there are a few good articles that tell you not to do it, especially on the router. Uh, since we developed our components outside of the rest, they don't know about the router. And you have every way to do that with uh, Vue, React, or Angular. Uh, the, each router are designed to allow you to do it, but lots of, I see too much projects having, like, in the UI component, this the dollar router, for example, uh, with the Vue. You should get your data from the top with attributes, properties, etc. There are many other stuff you should look at when you try to decouple uh, modern web applications. So I talked about the router. I talked about da data management or state managers like React, etc. But in our current applications, we have, like everyone, a loading indi indicator, some you know, messages like, OK, it's, it's good, or there is an error, etc. I saw too much projects coupling the implementation of those singletons, global uh, you know, components in the app, with everything else. And if you uh, change the way you're, you're um, working, I mean, instead of having the child components know the API of the, the I don't know, messages, notifications component, you can just say, my component, when it starts loading something, emits an event. And yes, you'll try to rationalize the way you do it on your components, but if you have components for, from your team, from another team, and they have two ways to emit loading events or error events, you'll just have to have two lines inside your um, loading indicator or messages component saying, I want to catch those events, I want to catch those. But you really change the way people, uh, components know about themselves. So, did we choose the right tool? Web components, etc. I'll try to say polite, so I'll let you look at it, but we don't care about this question. It's not the right question. The question is actually much more about how much does it cost to change our minds? And in our case, we, we really looked at what we needed. We learned some stuff about standards that are inside browsers right now. And if you look at the history of the DOM, my knowledge about DOM manipulation and events is still relevant like 15 years later. And I really think it's going to be the same way for, for web components. And the small layer we used, like lit elements, small libraries we use, are really small. So we can just let existing components use that if we change our minds. And it wasn't really hard to, to learn. It wasn't like we need a five week, uh, one week training, etc. So um, I'm a bit late. So looking into the future, uh, what will happen? First rule of futurology, beware of those who uh, predict the future. What I think will happen, and again, it's my opinion, uh, is that frameworks will be more like compilers tomorrow. So the creator of Svelte has a good article about that. Uh, the creator of Ember, too, has a good uh, article about that. But the idea is that all of this JS we had here will go some of it will go inside the browser, and some of it will go inside the server side at compilation time. Okay. So, how is it, Hubert? I don't know. Uh, yeah. 
I don't know. I didn't have time to go inside the details. I mean, I've done so much re research on all those frameworks. I tried to share the way they see things so people can adapt their own context. For problem number one, I tried to insist on the needs of those who build the project and the needs of those who use the project. Um, and really go back to being professionals. I mean, what are our problems? Uh, what problems does it solve? Do we have that problem? For problem number two, uh, I try to deconstruct and, and really think in an horizontal way. I hope people will remember my bookshelf, maybe, and, and look at their own tooling set, tool set and see what parts are in it, etc. For problem number three, I try to explain how we are currently trying to isolate layers at, at Clever Cloud. Uh, we, we didn't invent anything, we are just trying to apply existing software practices. And those are, um, you know, principles. Uh, just need, you don't need to follow them blindly. If it costs you uh, triple the, the time to just have beautiful codes, again, you lost the, int the important stuff. So, again, there are exceptions. So I'd like to thank you, Doctor, because it helped me to, to see the, the landscape of everything. And I'd like also to, to thank everyone in the audience for this group therapy. Thank you.